Today, we are in week two of this series, The Gospel According to Johnny Cash, in case you snuck in late. Uh, And during this series, we are spending some time, especially in the sermon each week, looking at a portion of Johnny's life with the hopes that we will be able to discern how we can better walk with Christ by looking at how he walked with Christ throughout his life. And so just like last week, we're going to talk a lot about Johnny Cash uh, this this morning, and, and we'll do that next week as well, because I really want us to get to get a good sense of who he was and what he did during certain seasons of his life. Again, like we said last week, with the hopes that we will begin to see our story in his story as we look at the life of this flawed saint. And I think that shouldn't be too difficult for us to do, because remember, Johnny, if you know anything about his life, you know that he was far from a perfect man, that he made a lot of mistakes in his life, that he did a lot of things that he looked back on and regretted. And I said this last week, I'll say it again. I think if he was standing up here with me, he would affirm that and say, yes, I did. There were seasons of my life where I lived in such a way that I wish I could go back and do it differently. But... He never let that stop him from being who he believed God had created him to be. And I think we will see that, especially in the season of life that we're going to look at, that we're going to look at this week. We're also going to look at some scripture every week that I believe connects to Johnny's story in, in some way. And this week we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 25, and we're going to read verses 31 through 40. Let's read it together this morning. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. The king will say to those at his right hand, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or you naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say together, thanks be to God. This passage from the Gospel of Matthew is the very last full teaching that we get from Jesus before he makes his way to the cross. In fact, if you were to open the Pew Bibles in front of you and flip to Matthew 25, you would see that in chapter 26, the very next chapter is where Judas betrays Jesus. It's where the Last Supper is shared amongst Jesus and the disciples. It's where Jesus goes to the garden to pray and is arrested. And it's where Peter denies Jesus three times. All of that is in the very next chapter from what we just Read. So this teaching really is the last little nugget that we get from the mouth of Jesus before he makes his way to the cross, before the cross becomes this undeniable reality, both for him and for the disciples. All that to say, I think it's worth us paying attention to what Jesus teaches on here in his last moment to teach before the cross. And you probably notice something here, and and it's a trend that happens in, in Matthew, especially. The closer that Jesus gets to the cross in the Gospel of Matthew, the more he talks about the end times. The more uncomfortable his parables and his teachings become, the more he references the final judgment. And this passage is no different, clearly, right? It starts off with Christ sitting on a throne, separating the sheep from the goats or the righteous from the unrighteous. And we learn that what makes the righteous righteous 
is because they fed Jesus when he was hungry. They gave him something to drink when he was thirsty. They welcomed him when he was a stranger. They clothed him when they saw him naked. They took care of him when he was sick, and they visited him in prison. And the sheep ask a question, don't they? The righteous ask a question. They say, Lord, when did we do that? Because as far as we can remember, we never saw you hungry. We never saw you thirsty. We never saw you sick. We never saw you in a stranger. And in essence, asking, are you sure that you have the right sheep? Because we don't remember doing any of that, especially for you. And the king, Jesus, will answer them. And this is one of the most quoted passages in all of scripture, isn't it? Just as you did it to the least of these You did it to me. And here's what I was struck by when I was reading this passage this week. The righteous are the righteous. The sheep are the sheep in this this parable because of pretty mundane, seemingly forgettable from their reaction, right? Practices of kindness. When Jesus tells them that they are the sheep, that they are the righteous, it seems like they don't really understand Because much to their confusion, Christ isn't demanding that that the sheep be great speakers or that they be great martyrs or great believers or even extreme givers. It doesn't seem like the bar for entry is really any of that for these sheep. Instead, it is these small, unspectacular deeds of righteousness that revealed the flock that they really belonged I think it's through moments like this in the scriptures that that we learn that when we do the work of Christ, we come face to face with Jesus. And it seems to me that Johnny Cash was well aware of this. The first time that Johnny Cash and the Tennessee Two, remember that was the band that they started out with at the very beginning of their music career, the first time that they played a live public show together was at a church in North Memphis in 1954. One of their neighbors had asked if the trio would be willing to come and play some gospel music for their Sunday evening service. And this was, of course, before any record deals or any fame. And they said, yes, they agreed, but they had one problem. They didn't know what they were supposed to wear. Nobody owned a suit, and the only color shirts that they had in common already living in their closets were black. So that's what they wear. And that's where this man in black persona began. And of course, it became an, an iconic part of what Johnny Cash stood for as his career and as his fame grew. At first, if you can remember, it represented his ties to this outlaw country music movement that he was a part of, and, and it tied him to people like Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings. But soon it became more than just an image for Johnny. It really became, became a way of life for him. He began to be known as the man in black who stood with the outlaws and the outcasts of society. The one who made sure to remember the forgotten and the ignored of the world. And he solidified that man in black persona when he first performed the song that we just sang together in 1970 on the campus of Vanderbilt in in Nashville. And the song itself really couldn't be any clearer, right, for why he chooses to wear black. I wear the black for the poor and the beaten down, living on the hopeless, hungry side of town. And again, if you know very much about Johnny's story, you know that that this persona, this image, this song, this whole man in black act, this, this projection of solidarity with those who have been forgotten by society, that it really was not just a show for him. It was something that he actually lived. And it was something that I believe after reading his story, something that I think actually ended up saving him. Cash played his first concert for prisoners in 1953 at a prison in Huntsville, Texas. 
It was an outdoor concert, and thunderstorms rolled in and tried to ruin the show, but Johnny kept playing anyway, but they had to cut off all of the microphones. And so the inmates disobeyed their orders to stay in their seats and instead rushed up to the foot of the stage so that they could hear him play his music. And something that could have resulted in disaster was actually a turning point for him. Because Cash, in that moment, felt a connection to an audience that he really had never felt before. And over the next decade, and this was something that I learned about Johnny reading about him in preparation for this series. Over the next decade, he played more than 30 prison shows all around the country, all without any compensation. It just became something that he believed in, and somewhere where he thought he belonged, which gets us to around the year 1968, about 10 years after that first prison show. And artistically, in this moment, Cash is is kind of on the downslide. Record executives were beginning to doubt him. The younger generation was more into artists like the Beach Boys and the Beatles, and Johnny was becoming more and more irrelevant. And not only that, but he was beginning to lose his voice and his vision, and his record sales reflected that. But it wasn't just a bad year for him artistically. It was a really tough year for him personally as well. Over that last decade, he had really struggled with addiction, heavy addiction. And just the year before, he and his first wife, Vivian, had been divorced. But by 1968, he had managed to to get sober. And though he was still kind of somewhat broken personally, he was trying to discern what was next for him. Not only professionally, but also personally. Who was he supposed to be as he entered this new season of his life? And his idea was something that no one had ever done before. He decided that he needed to try and capture the energy of all of those performances that he had done behind prison walls. And so Cash wanted to make a live recording record of one of those concerts. And so he took it to his record label executives. And what do you think they said? They said, no way, there is no way that we are going to haul all of our recording equipment into a prison, are you crazy? And then put out a record with inmates on it where you can hear them yelling and cheering and hollering and screaming because there's no telling what they might say. And so Cash did what any man in black should do, right? He ignored the record executives and he did it without them. And soon the concert was booked. It was booked for Folsom Prison for January 13th, 1968. And the day itself was dreary and overcast. It was gray and Cash and his crew seemed a little bit uncharacteristically reflective as they arrived for the show. And the prison itself was was tense that morning because just a couple of weeks earlier there had been a big conflict among the inmates and, and the guards. But all of that seemed to fade when the show finally started. And if you've never listened to that record, Johnny Cash, live at Folsom Prison, that is your homework for this week. That's the, I think that is the best homework that a preacher will ever give you. So if you don't do it, it's not on me, it's on, it's on you. It is so good. From the very first song with his iconic intro, Hi, I'm Johnny Cash, I'm not even going to try and do it because I, I, can't, I can't pull it off. To the last song that he played for them, a song called Greystone Chapel, which was actually a song that was written by one of the inmates sitting in the audience that he added to the set list the day before. And the chorus goes like this. Inside the walls of prison my body may be, but my Lord has set my soul free. It was a song about the chapel that was inside of the prison. Live at Folsom Prison went on to establish itself as as literally one of the greatest albums of all time. And it became the billboard for Cash's man in black persona, his connection to the forgotten and the outcast of of society. And it also began to set him apart from all of those other artists. 
I read this in a book and it was so sassy, but I'm going to include it. While the Beatles were singing All You Need Is Love, Johnny Cash was performing in unair conditioned maximum security prisons for free. He began to chart his own path yet again, just like he did at the beginning of his, of his career. But the more I thought about it this week, the more I realized that there, there's really something deeper, I think, about that, about that record. And maybe if you go and listen to it today, you'll notice the same thing. That all of the cheering and all of the applause and the hollering and the laughing and the calling out that you hear from the audience on that, on that live recording, it reveals, I think, at least to me, that the real star of the show for that performance really isn't Johnny Cash. It's the prisoners in the audience. And what I think that means in a very real way is that the inmates of Folsom Prison saved Johnny Cash. I mean, something that started, started so small and halfway on a whim, if you read the story of it, at a prison in Huntsville, Texas, interrupted by a storm, ended up having such a massive impact on his life at just the right time. I mean, remember, his career was on the downslide at this moment, and his sobriety was new and fragile, and he really didn't know who he was supposed to be. And I believe that Cash went to Folsom Prison that day looking for grace, and I think he found it at the embrace of the thieves and the outlaws in the audience. I really think that they were Jesus for him that, that day. And that is the kind of reversal that we see in our scripture for today. I mean, that is the kind of reversal that we have to begin to try to wrap our minds around if we want to begin to understand the gospel, much less the gospel according to Johnny Cash. Because when I read that scripture, I can't help but notice that Jesus doesn't identify himself with the sheep or with the righteous. Did you notice that? Jesus doesn't paint himself as the one who's visiting the prisoner or clothing the naked or sheltering the homeless. Instead, in the parable, Jesus comes to us as the homeless and the hungry and the naked and the prisoner. I mean, remember his words, just as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. According to Jesus, when we welcome the homeless and when we visit the prisoner, we aren't the saviors. We are the ones being saved. And I think that is exactly what happened to Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison in 1968. He came looking for redemption. And he was saved by the forgotten of society. This parable and this story of the man in black, I think it's a reminder to us today that if we want to be with Jesus, we have to be willing to do the work of Jesus. And that is where we will find him. It's a reminder to us that songs are nice and so are words. But the real question I think we have to ask ourselves is what is it that our hands are actually doing Where are our feet carrying us? What path is it that we are walking? What is the direction that we are going? And what destination is that going to drop us at? I think we have to be willing to ask ourselves the question of how God is calling us to embody this kind of love, this kind of action, this kind of of reversal. Because I wonder if Johnny wasn't here with us, if he wouldn't ask us the same question. I think if we can learn anything from the man in black, it's to where he found the hope of Christ. And it was with these forgotten folks. Because the truth is, we don't know when this time will come. We don't know when this day of judgment that's depicted in this parable, we don't know when that is going to happen for us. But we do know what Jesus expects us to do in the meantime. And we know where we are to find his presence. 
And it's really no different from where Jesus found himself when he was walking the earth. It's to feed people who were hungry and to welcome the stranger and to clothe the naked and to care for the sick and and to visit the incarcerated. And look, I get it because I agree with you. It sounds so simple. It sounds so mundane. It sounds so small. It doesn't have a lot of fanfare, right? It's not going to get you in, in the spotlight. But remember, just as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. That is the gospel according to the man in black. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for tuning into our message this week in the gathering. We hope you found it meaningful and life-giving. As always, you're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., either in person here in the chapel or online. If you want to know more about who we are at Bluff Park United Methodist Church, you're invited to check out our website. There you'll find out who we are, what we have going on, and how you can be a part of it. As always, friends, if there's anything that we can do for you, you're invited to reach out to us. We are here to help you and support you in any way that we can. We hope that you're having a great week, and we look forward to seeing you soon.